All right. Um, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Klein and I serve as the project director uh, for the Take Heart initiative. Uh, we welcome you to module five today. Module five is titled building and implementing a successful automatic cardiac rehabilitation referral system. Um, you know, on the next slide here, so today's presentation is the fifth out of 10 modules. So you've made it to the, the halfway point in Take Heart. Uh, and today's modules des uh, designed to provide implementation support, help you share best practices uh, with other Take Heart hospitals that are implementing automatic referral with care coordination. So um, all of our training modules are guided by the roadmap established by the Million Hearts uh, cardiac Rehabilitation Change Package. You've heard us refer to it as the CRCP, uh, and this is located on the, the Take Heart website, so it's always accessible to you. Uh, as a reminder, the format for today's sessions follows um, sessions that have been similar in the past. So we start today with the subject matter expert presentation. Uh, we do look forward to having some discussion in the chat. Uh, and the polling features maybe a little bit after the session as well and uh, to allow for some of that peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, after this session and i hope you guys find useful uh, we will send out the guidance materials or the implementation guide that helps reinforce the materials uh, that are presented here today and then technical assistance follows next week with your partner hospital peer action groups um, these are really, really important to attend. Um, you know, we have found in the earlier cohort that this is really a great place to do some more of that peer to peer sharing to really hear from your partners, um, from your teammates, from your other hospitals, some of the things that they're encountering, how they are, um, you know, addressing some of those challenges and things like that. So your peer action groups meet um, next week with your coaches. And, um, you know, at that time, you can ask those questions, but please also know that anytime throughout, you can reach out to one of your coaches um, to be able to get any questions um, or any concerns that you have addressed along the way. Um, uh, as we have with past sessions, we do have CEU credits available for today's session, and um, we'll follow up with an email about that as well. And then last, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we are really interested in engaging some dialogue during this session. And so um, what you can do is if you look towards the bottom of your screen, you can find um, a conversation bubble similar to the one that's pictured here. If you click on that bubble, it will open the chat box if it's not already open for you. Uh, we ask that you do set the field to everyone so that everybody can see your question. Um, and then we can have some of that dialogue going on. Um, you know, we, we try to answer as many questions as we can during the session. If there's something we can't answer, we'll certainly follow up by email. Uh, you may want to go ahead and try the chat function now, sending a short greeting, saying hello to some of the folks um, uh, and, um, you know, be able to, to start the discussion that way. All right, and with that, I am going to pass it over to Steve Hines to do a little bit of a review of where we've been and where we're going to go. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Cynthia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope it's less dreary where you are than uh, where it is in Washington, D.C. today. So let's look back on what do we know up to this point, and just as a very quick review, because it seems like the first five modules are going by very quickly. Uh, and in modules one and two, we talked about the, the importance of creating a multidisciplinary team with a strong champion who can navigate and push the project forward and how to create an aim statement and how to develop an action plan. And those are activities that you should be well on your way to finishing if you haven't completed them already. Obviously action plans will continue to evolve over time, but to have an initial one as well as a clearly defined aim, that's really foundational work. In module three, we moved on from that to talk about workflow processes. And um, in the peer action group that I facilitated most recently, we had a great discussion about things that people learned in as they did their current workflows uh, and, and looked to see what was going on. And I heard some great stories about the value of including patients in those. So if you're still working on that, by all means, you know, get patients perspective. You'll be surprised at what you learn from that that can help your operation uh, work more effectively to support your patients needs. And then most recently in module 4, we laid the groundwork to really understand care coordination. 
uh, or excuse me, to, to understand the value of data, which is really foundational to both care coordination and to the successful implement, implementation of automatic referral. Uh, you really need data to understand what's going on in your program and very importantly, for the patients before they get into your program. That's where the biggest gaps are. So we hope that you're already moving along to collect that data. Obviously, um, that it can take years to get all of the data that you'd like to have, but getting started with some of that data is really critical. And that leads us up to today. Uh, and modules five through 10 um, is where we're leaping. So module one through four kind of lays groundwork. Module five um, is really where we dive into the first of the two really substantive activities. So um, uh, um, just as a review of, of care coordination, what constitutes a completed referral, um, we suggest that, you know, um, uh, a good system has automatic referral of the patients into cardiac rehab. A better situation, uh, a better um, circumstance, you've got both automatic referral plus the ordinary, uh, the ordering clinician uh, has a conversation with the referred patient to talk to them about the value uh, uh, of cardiac rehab and how it can help them. And then ultimately, the best is when you have automatic referral plus those patient conversations, plus you're scheduling the patient for the first CR visit before they're even discharged from the hospital. So that's really what we uh, are aspiring to and we, what, what we really like for all, you and all of your patients. So that leads us up to today and what our learning goals are. So we want you to understand why implementing automatic referral benefits your patients and your program, uh, because uh, as, as COVID recedes, hopefully permanently, uh, and just becomes a part of the set of things that we all can get over time, um, that that should be expanding um, your, your program's capacity to support additional patients uh, and automatic referral is, is one of the best ways that you can get to increase the number of patients that you can support. And then secondly, we want you to understand how to design and work with your IT department to develop um, your EMR specifications and how to, um, that, that will be the basis for your automatic referral system. I really want to stress the importance of working with your IT department. This is not a project that you can tell your IT department to do. It really has to be a joint activity that involves you as much as them, and it involves all parts of your program, not just the IT people. And then third, we want to, you to understand how to create a testing plan so that you can, before you go live with anything that you may wind up regretting, you can create a program, make sure that it's working, that it's referring the correct patients and not annoying patients or providers by um, uh, suggesting people for uh, cardiac rehab that are just not appropriate because of some kind of counterindications. So that's where we want to take you now. Um, uh, in our last cohort, we, we got information from each of them about the, 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 the EMRs that they were using in their facilities, and it was a pretty even blend between Epic and Cerner with a, about a fifth of the, uh, of the facilities using Meditech. Typically, those are smaller facilities. So some of the examples that we're providing, uh, you know, will come from, um, you know, we'll be informed by the conversations that we've had with Cerner and with Epic, um, and and those two are um, uh, th those two systems were used by uh, the two panelists that you'll be hearing from shortly. Um, uh, I, I think that probably 80% of what you'll do, you'll do the same way regardless of whether you're using um, Cerner, Meditech, or Epic. Um, but there are some differences, um, and the Q and A sessions that we've done already that you may have listened in on or the one that um, is going to be coming up in the future. Those are where places where you'll be able to learn some additional information specific to whichever uh, EMR your facility happens to use. So uh, at this point, I'm delighted to introduce our, our two panelists and uh, our respondent for, for today's uh, presentation. Kathy Lee Bishop um, uh, worked 
and oversaw the implementation of automatic referral in the Emory program uh, and uh, where, she, where she works. Uh, and uh, she's been a panelist on one of the Q&A sessions and has some fabulous insights with respect to both the technical and the cultural changes that you need to make to successfully implement automatic referral. And then Amy Miller is an associate CMIO at, at Mass General Brigham Healthcare, uh, and she used an EPIC system to implement an automatic referral for her patients in that system. And then Becky Chappelle um, is joining us live on the conversation today, and we'll be bringing her in um, after we've heard from Kathy Lee and Amy to discuss um, uh, what her experience was like um, as a member of the first cohort as she uh, worked with um, her colleagues uh, in Spectrum Health to implement automatic referral there. So Becky is from Spectrum Health West in Michigan where um, uh, it could still be snowing for the next two months. Uh, and um, uh, she's a delightful panelist that we uh, are, are looking forward to, to sharing with you. So at that point, we're going to transition and 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 hear Amy provide the initial overview of automatic referral and uh, how they went about uh, implementing it within their facility. Thank you, Steve, and I want to welcome everyone today. Um, as Steve said, to be successful, there are kind of two pillars that you need, right? So the automatic referral and care coordination. Today, we're going to be focusing exclusively on the automatic referral. Uh, care coordination is going to be addressed in a future module. So when we say automatic referral, uh, what exactly do we mean by that? So um, we want these to be things that are truly built into the workflow so that unless the provider does something to opt out, the order is going to happen. It's not I'm trying to get the provider to do it, but rather I'm, I'm putting it in the workflow so much that it magically happens unless the provider says, oh my God, no, I don't want this. Let me remove it. So uh, this way, you know, the goal is that the system identifies all the patients who qualify. It makes sure they don't have some contravening factor that would make them inappropriate for it, puts that order into the things that the provider is already doing so that it truly is an automatic frictionless experience for the provider to place the order. Um, Kathy Lee, do you want to tell us a little bit about Emory and, and your experience with automatic referrals? Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we're a large healthcare system in the South. Uh, we have eight um, different hospitals. Some are academic teaching and some are community-based hospitals. We also have 25 ambulatory uh, cardiovascular facilities that are spread out in the region. So our process really started with a review from the quality metrics of our cardiology division. Um, get with the guidelines, looking at the action in the PCI registry. And we really wanted a better way of, you know, tracking, are we really referring to cardiac rehab? And at that time, all those hospitals had a different process. It wasn't standardized. A lot of it was paper driven. And we had no way of drilling down to the actual details. So it was at that time when we started this process, which is about five years ago, we had less than 20% of our patients were being referred for cardiac rehab. And so we had a target and it was a really great place to start. Uh, we also had a wonderful physician champion who uh, brought all the players together and then had us really work well with developing action plans and making us you know, stay accountable to this. And not only what was our purpose, but what was it going to benefit and who was it going to benefit was really helpful to our process to remember, especially when we got in the weeds and the details and the challenges, just stepping back and saying, why are we doing this? What is our process? What is our outcome? And what's going to be our endpoint? And that was really helpful, you know, with our, our overall team. That's great. Thank you. Um, in terms of our organizational background at Mass General Brigham, so we have two academic medical centers, about five community hospitals. Um, we were asked uh, by one of the academic medical centers to, to look into options. Initially, the focus was really on ambulatory referrals. Um, and as we kind of looked at technical options, we found that we could do a much better job on the technical side of helping automate on the inpatient side. And in fact, we're going to focus today on inpatient because that does seem to be so far for the programs that have done this an, an easier uh, place to focus and to have success. 
Uh, we do have some ambulatory alerting in present, uh, present in our system, but nothing that I would call true automation. We've had the inpatient automation up for a couple of years. It has been, uh, we think, pretty successful. Um, do uh, as Kathy Lee uh, referred to in large part to kind of multidisciplinary collaboration with the clinical side and the IT side working together to figure out what would work uh, and then implementing it. You know, you know, one of the the statements on this or bullet point on this slide was key advice for peers just starting out. Just remember, it's got to be fluid. Um, you, there were things that happened in the past two years that we didn't expect. The one of the neighboring healthcare systems um, opted not to have Kaiser Permanente as part of their system. Kaiser Permanente came to us, and so it was kind of starting all over again with the education, the process, not really understanding how Kaiser process. So don't get so fixated that it's done. Realize that you have to be able to be flexible and evolve as things come up that you didn't expect. Absolutely. I think uh, this past year has taught us all about uh, how things will continue to come up that we don't expect. So I think that in, uh, I believe it was module three, um, you all kind of mopped, mapped out your current workflow processes and, and had some discussion about barriers that you run into. So the whole idea that we need automatic referrals implies that without an automatic referral, we're stumbling over some things. So some of the challenge are things like beliefs that maybe cardiac rehab isn't beneficial. Maybe this patient wouldn't go anyway, so, so why should I bother sending an order because it's just going to be a waste of time? Um, maybe it's someone else's job, right? Do I know this patient really qualifies? What are the exclusion criteria? Are they appropriate? Uh, and concerns about when is the right time? Um, is now the right time or should I wait? So all of those things are kind of uh, opportunities for us to not act, to not place the referral. And those are the things that the automatic referral is really designed to protect you from uh, and, and keep you from stumbling over those obstacles. So, sorry, go ahead. Okay, excellent. So, um, in terms of the belief that cardiac rehab may not be beneficial, the referrals really allow us to look at the evidence, build the referrals in an evidence-based evidence fashion, and then there's nothing to stand in the way of that delivery. Our own kind of personal biases and beliefs don't trip us up. Uh, in the same way, the, the thought that this patient in front of me might not bother to come, we don't prejudge the patient. The system gives everyone the opportunity to be referred and to get the benefit of cardiac rehab. In terms of the uncertainty about when or how, we really make it consistent. So it's the same timing, same mechanism for everyone. It takes the decision about whose job is it out of the clinician's hand and puts it into the system so that the referral is always placed. Although, as I said, the provider has the opportunity to say, no, in my clinical judgment, this patient isn't appropriate and I'm going to opt them out. And it takes into account all of what our ideas of inclusion exclusion criteria are based on the available information available to us in the EMR. And we can program that in so that it is all taken uh, appropriately into consideration. And Amy, one of the things we did with that was uh, we, when we met with our stakeholders and they said, but there are patients that even though they meet the criteria that I feel as a physician shouldn't be. And so what we did is we, um, we got a consensus of what those top diagnoses were to allow that physician to have that freedom if something came up and, you know, God forbid that they have, end, you know, they have a PCI and have end stage cancer at the same time that they didn't know. And so we wanted to give something so the physicians felt that they weren't so restricted, but had some um, decision making as part of it, too. Thank you, Kathy Lee. So in terms of thinking about uh, the various patient populations, um, the easiest situation in terms of things that we can control are when it's our patients and it's our system, right? But that's certainly not always the case. Sometimes you're using uh, a different EMR. Sometimes it's not your patients, it's patients from another location. So as we have more things that move out of our control, things get a little bit more complicated. We're gonna be focusing today on eligible patients at your hospital in your system. So those internal kind of things. Now those can be referred to external cardiac rehab programs, um, but we're gonna be focusing primarily on the yellow box 
uh, because it is quite frankly the easiest case. Um, if we think about kind of the different implementation strategies uh, based on those, uh, as I said, the yellow is the easiest. That's where take heart focuses. As you kind of branch out to other patient populations, other EMRs, things get more complicated from the technical side as well as kind of the care coordination and clinical side. Um, and so, and then when you go to external programs, there are some financial considerations in terms of do you, uh, are you talking about leakage and lack of revenue capture that can make things very challenging. So, as we said, for appropriate referrals, uh, you need not just the automatic referral, but also that care coordination. So there has to be a human touch, uh, and that will be a focus of a future module. Okay, so when you're thinking about how, how you're going to implement this, keep in mind that in general, your EMR is already live, right? So you are trying to do something into an existing information systems ecosystem, and those ecosystems are not created equally. And so is it easiest to do this as you admit the patient or as you discharge the patient? That actually is gonna vary from institution to institution. So this really needs to be an early conversation between IT and clinical cardiology to come to a shared understanding of how this will work best at your facility in your existing system uh, and kind of use that as your starting point. Kathy Lee, do you wanna to talk to us a little bit about some of your insights on this? Sure. Um, so one of the challenges we, we had was we made assumptions as a healthcare system that we were all using the same order sets at every single hospital by every cardiologist and cardiothoracic surgeon. And so one of the things we had to do was gather that information and we realized we were making an assumption and it really wasn't true that everyone was following the same standardized practice when it comes to referring for cardiac rehab. And so one of the things we had to do was get all those hospitals and whoever would own, quote unquote, that order set, you know, to the table with us to say, you know, what is best practice and what is best for our patients where it doesn't really impact the overall or make additional work on the workflow. And, and to me, that's part of the buy-in of what's the purpose of doing the automatic referral who does it benefit and what's that outcome? And so once everyone understood that, they didn't feel, you know, like some of the community hospitals didn't feel like we were, you know, stepping on their toes or the, you know, academic teaching centers didn't feel like we were putting something additional because one of the challenges with the academic teaching center is the, the clinic, the floor staff changed every month. And so, you know, they, they'd be like, oh, what do I have to do now? Why is this popping up? This didn't happen on the other floor. And so, some of the challenges of this, and I like that this is um, cyclical, is that you do have to keep moving on it. It's just got to keep evolving. And, you know, it's, you know, when I look at our community hospitals, they deliver great care to our patients, and we were just asking them to even go another level. And same thing with the academic side. And so once everyone realized what the best was for the patient, we were all on board. That's great, and I, I totally agree. It is a it is a, always an evolving process, um, but once you get everyone on board, it can be an incredibly rewarding process as you move through it. So the aim of your goal, um, you know, it's it's good to know from the outset what you're trying to do. So we're trying to increase the number of patients who've had a heart attack, had PCI, had cabbage, who are not just referred, but enrolled and participate. And so the goal is to increase that by 30%, right? So we wanna do all the things we can, not just the automated referral, but the other components like the care coordination to try and achieve that increase by December 31st, 2022. So as you're thinking about how to do this, as Kathy Lee said, this is a team sport, right? So when you're thinking about your team, you need a lot of people. So you need your cardiac rehab champion, you need your cardiac care clinicians, your cardiac rehab clinicians, your care managers, your IT staff, your QI leaders, and don't forget the patients, right? So, so you wanna think about how you have representation from all of those groups um, and have them early on. Don't build it and then take it to someone and say, here's what we built that doesn't work for you. Um, but to kind of create the team from the outset uh, and work together as a team. So, some of the things that are really critical to success, as I think many of you know, right? 
So having strong executive support, having leadership at the top saying this is important to us and we're going to give you the resources and support you need to make it happen. Having clear ownership, having very clear and effective governance and decision making, and then last but not least, uh, strong project management. Someone has to herd the cats and there will be many cats. Amy, before you, you uh, or, or Kathy continue, um, executive leadership has an awful lot of priorities that they're juggling. And as you work with them over really an extended period to implement automatic referral, um, uh, what did you do to keep them fully engaged over that time? It's easy to be committed at the start, but then other things come up. So, so what did you or your teams do to keep them committed and engaged um, uh, so that you could have a successful outcome? Amy, I'll follow you if you want to go first. Yeah, sure. So, so I think what we tried to do was kind of have our, our North Star of this project will uh, both improve patient care and in the no margin, no mission uh, vein, actually increase revenue. And so when there were questions raised, basically reminding people that the power of this project to achieve those two aims really allowed us to kind of keep driving forward. So um, for us, again, it, it's always good to inform the leadership so that there are no surprises. And so because they hear other team members saying, well, this is happening and we weren't informed. So it's really important that everyone is informed at whatever level they can take. You know, sometimes people's cups are full and overflowing like they've been in the past 18 months. But it was important to share on a maybe a quarterly basis so the leadership knew what the team was doing and how it was going to impact the hospital. So for us, it was about patient centered care. It was best practice. It was going to impact revenue. And the biggest thing was we were also thinking about readmissions at the time. And so that was something that everyone had their ear up at the time was, oh, how can we impact readmissions? So, you know, there was actually a separate readmission silo work group going on at the same time. And we actually started to communicate and they're like, cardiac rehab, that helps with readmissions. I'm like, yeah, that's what the literature shows. And so now we have two work groups where leadership could see that benefit of what we were trying to do. That's great. And I think those kind of clear goals uh, really help drive things along. Um, I think, you know, this mentions budget, right? And, and budget depends on how your IT resources are defined uh, and whether you actually have to provide funding for IT resources or not. We actually don't, so our only budgetary considerations were actually for kind of the care coordination resources in terms of uh, providing that uh, human touch, if you will. Um, but that may not always be the case. And so working with IT to figure out how you achieve the adequate resources, does that require budget or not? Um, I think is important. And Kathy Lee, I don't know if you guys had any issues with that. So what was really nice and similar, Amy, is that we didn't have quote unquote budget issues with IT. We got on typically it's six to eight months to be able to get on an IT rotation to develop a, a program like this. But because this was a quality metric for the healthcare system, it kind of brought us uh, toward the top of the list. And that was really helpful. Probably the biggest cost to all of us was the personnel time that we invested in the development, implementation, and reassessment. But then in the outcome, it demonstrated increased revenue and fewer readmissions to the hospital. So the healthcare system kind of went, let's take a breath. So that was a good thing. It's a great thing. So things you want to avoid. So common pitfalls, um, unclear project requirements. Um, this can be just lack of clarity or it can be different groups having different ideas because you never sat down and came to kind of a shared charter agreement of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, poor management along the way, lack of communication and siloing of aspects of the project. Not involving end users. Uh, we are uh, we have a, an unfortunate history of asking attendings in academic medical centers who never touched the system, right? So they're not the ones placing the orders. If you ask them about the orders, they're going to give total misinformation. So so working with the actual end user who's going to be touching the the application is very important. And then lack of testing um, and and kind of lack of 
thinking through all of the possibilities as you're doing the testing. It's very easy to test the obvious uh, and in doing so missing some things. Can you any other thoughts? Yeah, I, just a couple like I can I, when I think of failure, I could click a couple of different things on that slide. And, you know, one of the things I'll just start with was we had very good management. I was very lucky for that. We had a project direction, but the communication was challenging in that we are practicing clinicians and we talk in clinician, but IT doesn't talk in that same language. And so having a nurse in, uh, from the informatics team beyond this was so critical. We, we'd be like, oh, well, we're going to get an order. And she's like, an order, like an order set. And we're like, no, a referral. And they're like, well, what's a referral? And so something as simple as the difference between an order, order set and referral, it caused a lot of stumbling. So coming, having that nurse from uh, informatics was critical just to help have a common language. Um, the quality testing, uh, we did really great, and then when we were, if I told you the time range, we started with ICD-9s, and then we switched to ICD-10s one month before the rollout. And so that quality testing, we had to go back to the table, and that was eye-opening and humbling, And but that's what you do. It is indeed. So we've talked a little bit about this in terms of key people to involve. So this is all about patients, right? We want to deliver pa better patient care. And so making sure that we are thinking about the experience for patients and, and where appropriate kind of asking uh, patient committees, patient representatives to make sure that this ends up being a good experience for them and, and achieves the desired goal. The cardiac rehab champion, as we said before, the QI specialists, um, for some groups, everything reporting and uh, EHR build may be one group or it may be two separate groups. So making sure that you have both reporting and IT analytics, if those are separate from kind of your main IT department as they are for us, it's two separate groups. So we needed to make sure we had both. And as I said, the person who's actually gonna be entering the order, not the person who has some imaginary idea but doesn't ever actually place the orders. Kathy Lee, any other thoughts on the people? So just, you know, because we had a lot of community hospitals rolled into our healthcare system, um, there were a lot of physicians that had um, admitting practices, but didn't necessarily weren't a part of the project. They ended up being very key and even now doing education with them as far as the benefit and the purpose of it. And it's not that they didn't order cardiac rehab, but they still were in the community office base send a fax and then so again it's the education was really important also letting them know how critical they were to the care of our patients that was making them feel welcome uh, was really important in the process absolutely so once you have the right people gathered uh, you can start thinking about your design and and you guys have spent the time uh, a couple modules ago now back in module three thinking through what your workflows are, that's really kind of the foundation that you need to build this on, right? Is understanding how your current process works so you can figure out how you can, on top of that, incorporate in some automation. So just taking a step back for some terminology um, to make sure we're all on the same page. So order sets, we talk a lot about order sets in IT. So order sets are really just a group of standard kind of provider directives or instructions about the care of a patient. It's a very um, convenient tool for providers. You can think of it as a form of clinical decision support where the system is saying, here are all the orders that I think for this patient are appropriate, or we would say appropriate for 80% of the patients, right? So that's our rule for what makes it in an order set. The clinician can take things off, can make tweaks, but it really streamlines the process and helps them get uh, all the right orders in place. Um, we, in general, do try and put things like this into the existing order set. So things that, uh, that the provider is already using, sneak this order in so that as they're ordering their existing order set, they're incorporating this automated order. So as you're thinking about the design, there are kind of four crucial factors to think through. Who are you going to be uh, touching uh, to try and make this order happen? When in the workflow are you going to do it? How are you going to put it in front of them? And where in the patient experience are you going to try and achieve this? So if we think about the who, uh, identifying eligible patients, um, 
The advantage, if you will, of our billing system is that we have these very convenient CPT and ICD-10 codes associated with our patients, right? And that becomes a nice structure to tag this onto. So if someone went to the cath lab and had a PCI, I have a CPT code that tells me that. Same for their surgical procedures. If they're being seen for uh, myocardial infarction, chronic stable angina, et cetera, they in general will have ICD-10 codes associated for the purposes of billing that I can look to and identify, hey, this is someone who it is appropriate for me to send. They have one of the diagnoses. They've had one of the procedures that makes them appropriate for cardiac rehab. Now, there are also uh, exclusions, right? So you don't want to uh, frustrate people by trying to refer someone who, for example, is on hospice. So you want to make sure that you not only get the patients who have the criteria, but you also exclude people who have comorbidities or conditions that would be contraindications to cardiac rehab and eliminate redundancy, right? We don't want to see referral after referral for a single patient. Those types of things as they happen in the provider workflow, that really kind of decreases the provider trust in the automation and makes them more likely to start opting out. So the more that we can make this as targeted as possible, the more successful that it's going to be. In terms of when, as I said, some places this is going to be easier to do at admission and some places it's going to be easier to do at discharge. And so, so that's something that you will need to work through. Um, we chose to do it at discharge, but there are other places that find for their, uh, for their workflow, for their system, it works better to do it at admission. For outpatients, it gets incorporated into some type of care encounter. Um, as I said, we have struggled to find a good way to automate in the outpatient setting, and so um, we are focusing on inpatient for this project. Kathy Lee, other thoughts on this? So, yeah, um, the platform that we use in our healthcare system is the Millennium Cerner system, and it was set to do at admission. And so one of the things, the slide that you had up that had both the CPT and the ICD-10s, we use the ICD-10s to trigger, but we use kind of like a capture net for the CPT codes because someone may have been admitted with a diagnosis that changed because they ended up needing a cath or they needed to have um, a PCI or they needed to have bypass or even a valve replacement like a TAVI or TAVR. So having the CPT codes for us was a fail safe to catch that eligible patient at discharge where we couldn't change the ICD 10s to discharge. So how uh, one of the important things in the how is the opt out, right? Because clinicians don't like to lose uh, their ability to actually make decisions about care of the patient. So giving the, them the way to say, no, this patient is not appropriate is important. That being said, you want to make sure that not everyone is opting out, that the, the opt out usage is appropriate uh, and and see, are there problems? Are we sending this for the wrong patients and people are having to routinely opt out for them and we need to kind of tweak our definition of who should be getting the referral um, so that providers aren't finding that they need to opt folks out. Um, so again, you know, the more that you align from the outset, but you will make mistakes. And so you want to make sure that you have tools in the system that allow care to continue uh, and fix those mistakes, but also to recognize the mistakes are happening and improve the system as you go. It's really nice if there's an easy way for people to let you know when they see problems. So we have uh, a lot of links in our system that let someone just click something and type a message to us. Uh, we call them cranky comments, and it's a great way to find out when the system is misbehaving so that we can fix it sooner rather than later. Kathy, so, any thoughts on this? Yeah, one of the things in our design um, before implementation, we wanted to be able to track data and the power form that we use had discrete fields on it. And so same thing with the opt out form, it linked to a physician or a provider who used the opt out. But if there was an eligible diagnosis, we were able to follow up to, you know, and in some cases, just looking in the chart, you're like, oh, my gosh, this person transferred to hospice. That makes sense. And then you go. Oh, well, the physician just wanted a follow up. Well, maybe our power form didn't capture that. And maybe we need to go back and look at the power form that's filled out that says, don't start cardiac rehab for two weeks, want a physician follow up. So part of that, I think you mentioned it, um, Amy, was like that test retest of what's working, what's not working, and really hear from that end user at the bedside of 
oh, well, I've done this many. And that, the reason why I'm opting out is because I want to see my patient. It's like, okay, you know what? Let's go back at our design and see how we can improve that to make sure we're capturing those patients. Absolutely. Um, so for community provider referrals, um, you know, you can create a, a stop, right? So I run into this wall and I'm told, do you want to refer or not? Um, uh, for situations where you don't have kind of that order set to, to bake it into something they're already doing. If you're going to do this type of card stop alert, make sure that you're firing it to the right people, right? So you don't want to ask the dermatologist if the patient should be going to cardiac rehab. It's going to drive them crazy. Um, so you want to send this to cardiologists, internists. You want to send it during care encounters where it makes sense, uh, not necessarily during uh, care encounters where it might be more disruptive to them. Um, and again, you know, looking for the right patients um, as you're doing this. Any other thoughts on that aspect, Kathy Lee? No, I, I agree with all of those, Amy. You just, you, you want to make sure the right provider um, is involved because you don't want to upset even the dermatologist. <laughs> Not that dermatologists don't care about the heart. I'm sure that they do. So where, which cardiac rehab program are you going to refer to? Now, uh, it's entirely possible that this is a one to many, right? So I may have many programs that I need to go to. It may depend on the patient. Um, you want to make sure that you're kind of thinking about your full patient population and how you serve their needs. So not only what are the things I can deliver, but if I have a patient who is going to leave me and go to Florida, how am I going to handle that? Or am I going to handle it? I'm going to say that's not my problem, or is that something I'm going to try and take on? We do know that patient convenience is a major factor in participation. So we do want to make sure that this gets factored in as we're trying to make this work for patients in order to succeed. Kathy Lee, other thoughts on that? So one of the things we did with our, when, when we do the contact, we built into our communication power form 50 different cardiac rehab programs that were in the region. At the time when we initiated, we only had one cardiac rehab program. Well, if you think of traffic as a barrier to come to cardiac rehab, it's a barrier to come to cardiac rehab. And so we wanted to do that convenience for the patients. And they were like, really? You're going to give me information about an outside program? And we're like, absolutely. We're really about making sure that you've got continuity of care. And the patients were just so uh, excited to hear that we were willing to make sure we could find a cardiac rehab program closer to them, whether they worked or where they lived, and they got buy-in. And we actually heard that they would go back to their cardiologist and say, they referred me outside of the system for convenience. What's with that? So it was a really a win-win. That's really awesome. So once you've gone through all of that, now you figured out everything you need to know about your design. Uh, you figured out how to choose your patients, when you're going to do things, how it's going to appear to providers, how they're going to opt out, where you're going to send the patients. So how are you going to test it? Um, and testing is never perfect. You are always going to find that you miss things and, and things will evolve over time. But the goal is to catch as much as possible before you uh, put this in a place where it actually touches your providers and patients. So there are several phases to this. First thing is, of course, to figure out what you're going to do. Then you've got kind of your initial uh, behind the scenes bench testing. Then you've got pilot testing and then kind of a system wide testing. Um, Ideally, all before you implement. So if you're thinking about your testing plan, how many phases do you need? What is the goal of each phase? Uh, and what are kind of the criteria to make sure that you've completed that phase? Who do you need involved in it? How are you going to track and monitor how you're doing? How are you going to get feedback from people involved, particularly when you're in things like pilot phase and you have some end users involved? How are you going to give them the opportunity to let you know when there are problems? And how are you going to know when you're ready to move on to the next phase? I think um, there's a lot of information in your implementation guide, kind of some more details on this. So bench testing, this is really making sure that in kind of a, a non-production environment, something that doesn't involve, at all involve patient care, that you are actually identifying the right eligible patients for referral. Um, and you want to do kind of, we think about positive and negative testing, right? So I want to make sure that if someone's eligible, I identify them. And if someone's not eligible, I don't identify them. Um, you want to make sure that the referrals are going to the right place. So not just that I get the order, but it goes to say a work queue, the right mm -hmm. work queue so that someone will actually work it. 
and other uh, any other requirements that you have and kind of how you get that patient scheduled, you want to make sure that all of those dominoes are falling technically so that the tools are in place for this to work for patients. Um, without doing this type of testing, um, you might be okay, you might not. And so this is a really important way to make sure that you don't miss any kind of details in the bill. All right, thank you very much to uh, uh, both uh, Becky Lee and Amy for their uh, observations. And I wanna, at this point, bring in Becky. Uh, Becky, you've heard what um, was done at Emory and Mass General Brigham. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you did within your hospital system and how you made the decision to initially implement automatic referral and then how the automatic referral process worked for you. Absolutely. So. Um... Number one, just thank you for this opportunity for me to come in and kind of present and share some experiences that we've had at Spectrum. Um, so my name is Becky. As Stephen said, I'm a manager over our cardiac and pulmonary rehab department. Um, Spectrum Health, we have about five, or we do have five different cardiac rehab locations, and we service about 2.6 million customers within West Michigan. So we have a lot of patients that we're taking care of. So that was really one of the first identifying needs to say, hey, we need a process where we're not losing out on opportunities to take care of our patients, right? We know that cardiac rehab is not a high revenue generating department, but when you think about the long-term effects and the um, impact on patient care, it's it's so successful. And also, as mentioned earlier, the readmission rate is, is huge. So, when we decided to take part in um, Take Heart, it it was a huge blessing in disguise. Um, it was an area that we just really looked at, and um, Take Heart was give, gave us really the tools that we needed to be successful in implementing the automatic referral and utilizing our care coordinator um, as that in person um, face that represented us in the in the department. Yeah, th thanks very much. And and so from the time that you decided to start um, uh, to, to implement automatic referral to the time you were able to turn the switch and, and make it go live, how long did that take you all? You know, it took about, I'd say, six to eight months to be very transparent. There was a lot of um, testing phases that we had to go through. There was a lot of brainstorming sessions that went into play. We had a lot of... Um, different folks on the committee that could really give perspective on how this was going to be successful. So um, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's key to have um, your IT representative. We at Spectrum work with Epic analysts, that's our HR. And so that having that team member on there, knowing the functionality um, was, was imperative. It also is really important to have a strong physician leader to know what specific order sets that we want to tie our automatic referral to. We have it set up to um, be embedded into six discharge order sets, um, such as the cardiac catheterization, we have the cardiothoracic surgery, we have our heart failure. Um, so, so really knowing and testing. So during that six months, the first couple months, we would meet every other week just to have like a, the, our plan to see where are we at, what are, um, questions maybe that are outstanding, whether it's an epic question, whether it's a provider question. Um, and then once we had the foundation, we went into the testing. And that's when we work specifically with our analysts to say, in the background, in a non-prod environment, um, as mentioned before, are, are they triggering for appropriate patients? Do providers have the option to opt out? Um, if necessary, if they want to go to a, an external referral, it is so important that cardiac rehab, wherever done, is just completed, right? So we do really um, provide the education to our patients. Well, we would love to see you at our facility at the end of the day, just getting into a cardiac rehab um, department is so um, important. So after we did some testing in the non-production um, environment, then we uh, rolled out into the uh, prod environment. And I'll be very transparent. Um, the first go was, uh, it was successful. However, we did find opportunities to improve that that referral. So we had to make a couple tweaks over the, the year. And we actually rolled out the automatic referral in November of 2020. 
So it's been out for about a year and a half. Yeah, thanks very much. And and by all means, if you have questions for Becky or comments on things that you learned during the presentation from uh, Becky Lee or Amy, uh, enter those into the chat. We'd love to respond to your comments or questions um, as we wait for some of those to come in. Um, uh, everybody likes to hear about mistakes, Becky. So <laughs> as you look back on your process, what are a couple things that you realize, you know, in, in retrospect, wow, we would have really saved ourselves some time and some grief if we had done X instead of Y? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and and I, you know, at number one, you learn through all your failures and you turn them into successes, hopefully. So one of the things that we, when we initially wrote out, rolled out the automatic referral, um, we did not have the qualifying diagnoses embedded into it. So one of our first changes that we made was to embed the algorithm of, you know, a specific qualifying patients, right? So it was more of a uh, just verbiage within the referral. Um, at that point, the referral was still pulling the admitting diagnosis, which, for example, could have been coronary artery disease. Well, we know CAD is not a qualifying diagnosis for cardiac rehab, but if you received a stent due to coronary artery disease, that is. So um, what we ended up doing the second um, I guess, tweak to our referral is we actually put buttons within the referral that has providers choose the appropriate qualifying diagnosis. Um, this also, we also had a spot where a provider could free text other, um, which met the needs of compliance. So if I had a recommendation to anyone, I would definitely say when you're building this um, automatic referral, put the qualifying diagnosis as button so your team does not spend time um, trying to get a new referral for an appropriate diagnosis. And then um, just the last thing that we are doing right now is we are embedding an Emmy video, which is an educational video that is tied to our referral. So once a patient is referred to cardiac rehab, it will send them a video about what they can expect um, as an experience within our program. So that also help support um, uh, patients understanding and what to um, expect when they're with us. So, yeah, thanks. And and I, I'm curious what you did, uh, if anything, to educate the providers um, before you um, made the, your automatic referral system go live. Yeah. So um, number one, it was key to have uh, a provider on our committee in the beginning, just to learn their perspective. Some things that we did for provider education is um, at our facility, we have, a, it's called Epic Proportions, which is sent out monthly to our um, Epic providers. And it really discusses any changes within order sets, anything really with an Epic to make sure that they're aware of it. I created a memo with my team just to uh, make sure that they could visually see what that difference is going to look like within the orderable so they're not shocked the first time they see it. Um, I think engaging those providers is key to the success. Um, also, I would attend our different um, cardiology division meetings. I met with our cardiothoracic surgeons. I met even with our hospitalist um, and then our, our general cardiologist, making sure that they were aware of this change. It also gave us really time to promote our program. Um, you know, many of them knew we had a program, but I don't think they always knew um, how instrumental it is to the success of our patients. So I was able to brag about what we do too. Yeah, thanks. And there's a question uh, from Sarah Speck in the chat. Thanks for your question, Sarah, about uh, experience designing the order sets so that there's some sort of a trigger at the six month or excuse me, the six week um, uh, threshold for uh, heart failure patients. So do you, um, uh, do you identify the heart failure patients? And, and if so, do you have anything at that six month or six, six week window to, um, uh, to, to, to alert uh, your staff that they really should um, be uh, reached out to or the provider should be reached out to to try to get them into cardiac rehab? Absolutely. So we do have the automatic referral embedded into the heart failure discharge order set. So automatically we do get those referrals. So my team triages those same day or next day. Um, when we do see that patient is, is 
needing to wait six weeks prior to attending the program, we'll reach out to the patient and we'll let them know that we see that referral. We're going to go ahead and get it closer um, to when they have their follow-up with their surgeon or excuse me, their provider. Um, just to make sure that they are stable to enter the, the program. And then we actually will just defer that referral and then have it come back about a week before the, um, they're able to enter the program. All right, thanks. These have been great uh, insights. Uh, any last piece of advice uh, you would give to, to your peers that are on the verge of uh, working on automatic referral within their own hospitals or systems? Yeah, you know, a couple of things, um, like I said, just really communicating with your IT folks, making sure that they're on board from the beginning. Um, that is is key to being successful. The other really neat thing that we did was we have a dashboard that really reviews um, demographic of patients that are coming into our program. It's looking at um, who chose not to participate and really why they didn't to see, you know, is there something that we can do better to reach those individuals? Um, is it a financial aspect? Is it a location aspect? Um, so having that dashboard um, is, is important. And then also on our dashboard, it, we do look at the ICD-10 codes and also CPT codes to see if there's certain um, individuals that were missing. So that was important. Um, we still reference that dashboard monthly, if not weekly, I go in there to check it out. Um, but after implementation within the um, first month of us implementing our automatic referral, we saw an additional 61 um, referrals come through that second month, we saw an additional 95. So it works guys. Um, so if you have any questions, I am happy to answer any, reach out. I've given them my information. So I am here to support you in any way you can. Great stuff. Yeah, thank, thank you very much um, for, for, for great insights, for your willingness to help. And I, I really think one of the things that I admire as I get to know the cardiac rehab community is is the willingness to help each other. You're not competing with each other. You're you're really all competing to do the best you absolutely can for your patients. Uh, and we want to thank you all for that. Looking ahead, um, we want you to continue refining your action plan for implementing automatic referral um, and uh, um, working on the module five implementation guide. There's a lot of great information within that guide. By all means, uh, read it and um, uh, share it with others on your team. Uh, and then your upcoming peer action group meeting, that's the place for you to ask additional questions after you've had a chance to process the information that we've discussed today. Uh, just as a reminder with respect to the timing of those, um, uh, we, we want you to, incur, we want you to um, respond to the survey um, for the next week's peer action groups, um, and those are scheduled for next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So by all means, uh, uh, attend those if at all you can and, and respond to the survey. The next event, Module 6, is scheduled for April 13th, uh, same time, same station, uh, laying the groundwork for effective care coordination. So that's our first module that directly addresses care coordination, and you can register um, uh, uh, online at, at any point, and we encourage you to do that. Just a couple of additional things. We're going to have a community event uh, on March 23rd from 2 to 3 that features some of the some of your peers from the first cohort that have already worked on and made some uh, really valuable changes to their care coordination processes. So if you want to learn what some of your peers have actually done, what they've learned along the way, join us for that event on March 23rd. Uh, and again, there's an online place where you can register for that. Uh, and then, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there is going to be a Q&A session focused on EPIC uh, on April 27th. We had one a bit ago on Cerner. This is the one focused on EPIC, uh, and you can register for that event as well. So just um, as we wrap up, um, there are some questions that we'd welcome your feedback on if you want to enter, uh, answer those questions um, just to give us some information on what we're doing well and what we could be doing better. Uh, if you can just respond to those questions before you disconnect this afternoon. Thank you again for all of your time working on Take Heart as well as for all of your time that you invest in your patients uh, every day and every week. 
um, it's much appreciated by us and, um, and, 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 and of incredible value to your patients as well. So thank you all very much. We look forward to talking to you again in a, in a month and um, have an excellent rest of your day.